good to be here. It's good to be in the house of God. Amen. It's good to have a building to meet in too. Father, I pray your blessing upon the study of your word. I pray you'd give us hearts to, that are hungry for scripture and for the truth. Lord, we are in cased in lies and darkness. Open, open the word for us. Give us light. Guide us into all truth. I pray that you give the folks uh, hearts that are receptive and ears that want to hear. And, and Lord, bless those who are watching by the internet right now and those who will be watching later, listening later. I pray you'd use this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now, today we're going to pick up again where we left off last week. We're talking about Daniel. We're talking about the times of the Gentiles and the fullness of the Gentiles. We're talking about how relevant all of that is to right now. You can turn to book of Daniel, chapter number 1. And while you're turning, I want to read something that's current. The former president of the United, former vice president of the United States, Dick Cheney, was so fearful of assassination by terrorists sending an, uh, an electronic shock to his implanted heart defibrillator that he ordered doctors to fit a new device without a Wi-Fi capability. Now, did you get all of that? Uh, folks my age, a lot of times you get into this computer stuff and they, they get lost real fast. Now, I understand. Believe me, I do. I'm not to, I, you get lost real fast. Wi-Fi simply means that it sends out a signal that can be without a wire that can be picked up from practically any location. The doctor can implant a defibrillator in your heart and he can read what's going on in your heart in his office while you're at home, apparently. And uh, that gives him, of course, that's a great tool for the doctor or cardiologist to be able to look at your heart like that. But there seems to be the possibility that they can send a signal, since it is Wi-Fi, that they can send a signal to stop your heart. And uh, Vice President Cheney, as high as he was, you know, he's no fool. He's nobody's uh, yes man. He, he, uh, he feared that uh, they might try to assassinate him by turning off his defibrillator. So what does that mean? Well, how many of you understand that under Obamacare, there is a real possibility that you might have a chip implanted. Now this, you know, you can get on the internet, do a Google on it, and they'll say, oh, this is just a myth, and this is just a bunch of hyperbole, and people are getting carried away for no reason whatsoever. So I did just a little research in it, and I'll just take a couple of minutes with this, and we'll get into the lesson, but I think this, this relates to what we're talking about this morning. A fellow by the name of Paul McGuire from News with Views. How many's ever heard of that website? News with Views. Check it out sometime now. Uh, you might be surprised what he says, but here it is. The challenge for Christians and others will be the very act of taking a microchip implant, biochip implant, or med chip, simply because of its parallel to the biblical mark of the beast. Will people of faith be exempted for religious reasons, or will they be forced to take it or imprisoned? In addition, any microchip technology could be activated with enhanced controls after it is implanted. So what starts out as a simple microchipped implant could become a technology where at some future time you must worship the Antichrist as God and reject Jesus Christ as Lord in order to participate in the economic system. The built-in and evolving capacity of microchip technology makes this a dangerous possibility. In the final analysis, the simple act of accepting the implantation of a microchip for medical reasons appears harmless on the surface. However, there is no guarantee that once it is implanted that it will not be activated for the mark of the beast technology. This is the danger and challenge that lies before us. So what's he saying? He's saying simply that uh, right now it may not be, there may not be a whole lot to it and that you can have this chip implanted and uh, uh, of course the government always has its reasons for anything that it does. And uh, Obamacare of course would be the catalyst to do it right now because they want a universal health system in the country. And I'm not going to get off into all of that that's going on right now, but it's not, it's not working the way they wanted it to. And the website's crashed and crashed and crashed and crashed. You know, so people can't even enroll. 
But the bottom line is that it's open, it opens the door to what's called Pandora's box and makes a lot of things possible in the future. And I'd be very reluctant to have a chip implanted in my body. Not only can it read information, it can transmit to that chip certain commands and what have you. And the possibility is there. Some uh, experts and technology say the possibility is really there that once that, Im once that chip is implanted later on down the line, they could kill you at will. Not only can they trace you, but they can kill you. Yes, sir. Right. Good for him and good for the court that ruled in that. Uh, because they don't know what they're fooling with right now. This is high technology, these implanted chips. They have an enormous amount of information. They've got chips now where these bars, just to give you an idea of what's going on, all around the world. These people that frequent certain bars can have a chip implanted. And the minute they walk through the door, they start preparing their drink because they know exactly what they want and deduct it from their, from their account. And all of this information is instantaneous. It's right there at their disposal. So, you know, it's very handy and all that. But just because it's handy doesn't mean that you need it. Yes, sir. Disney World now, you have to wear, they send you a barcode on, on a band. Okay. When you get there you, at Disney World? They'll send it to you and you'll clip it on and it'll play your hand. <laughs> okay, the barcode's got all the information Disney World wants about you. And they can track you. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different uh, aspects to this technology. One's tracking, another's control, another's convenience, where you can purchase, so forth and so on. All these things come together in one in one thing. Somebody else? Yes, sir. Uh huh. You know, it wouldn't surprise me a bit that uh, the more they miniaturize this technology, and it's, everything's becoming miniature when they, uh, you know, they went a long way from the vacuum tube to the transistor. That's a huge jump. And everything now is becoming miniaturized. It wouldn't surprise me a bit if they can't just give you some kind of a shot or a uh, drink or something like that and put something in your body at that moment that stays in your body and it transmits electrical impulses and what have you. They can read it and control you and all that. So uh, if you take the mark, you got no hope. Watch out for it. Uh, I believe firmly that the church of God is going to be called out of this world before the tribulation period. But the tribulation period is not something that just begins, bang. The tribulation period is something that you go into, you transition into it. And then when that covenant is signed between the Antichrist and Israel, then you start seven years of the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, you need to keep this in mind, too. I don't know how many have been keeping up with this or not, but Iran has been, uh, Israel has said that Iran is no more than 30 days away from enriching, uh, from, from a nuclear weapon. Now, here's the key to nuclear technology. Nuclear technology can be used in a good sense, like we have down here at Kingston, to produce electricity. That's all fine. But you do not have to enrich alum uh, uh, uranium to do that. When you begin to enrich uranium, it is no longer for peaceful purposes. You're weaponizing it. You have crossed the line. So you can talk all you want to about peaceful use, but once you enrich uranium, then you're getting into weaponry. And that's exactly what's going on in Iran. And this is what Netanyahu has said to them, we will not let you get a nuclear weapon. So what does that mean? That means we have a window of 30 days Right now, a window of 30 days for Israel to strike Iran. And you and I both know that, ben, uh, that, uh, that uh, the President of the United States is no friend to Israel. And Netanyahu knows that. Benjamin Netanyahu, folks, is nobody's fool. Israel lives every day on the brink of survival. And they will do something. So I'd be, I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see a strike like they hit Osiric back there in the early 80s when they hit, uh, uh, what's his name over there in Iraq? Uh, uh, 
what was his name, Saddam, uh, Saddam Hussein, when they hit him, they'll do it. As sure as you hear me, they'll do it. And of course, they're not alone. They happen to have Michael working with them. <laughs> That's a big advantage. I had rather have an archangel on my side any time <laughs> if I had to go to war. You better believe it. <laughs> All right, the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel is one of the two books written during captivity. Look at Daniel 1, verse 1. The third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. All right, now, who is Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar is an emperor of an empire. And this empire has spread its tentacles all the way into the Holy Land. And now it's, and, and it is bringing into subjection, it is, it is taking land and people and resources. That's what empires do. Two books in the Bible are written during the time of the captivity, the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel. It's important to understand that the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel, both of them carry a common theme through that book. And that common theme is that God is a sovereign God, that even though the circumstances don't look good, you're off in captivity, He is still in control. And we'll find that in the book of Daniel. Look at chapter number 4 and verse number 34. Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. Daniel chapter number 4 and verse number 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes to heaven. Mine understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High. I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is everlasting, his kingdom from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? He takes no counsel of anyone. He's Almighty God. Amen. And so he chose to send Israel off into Babylonian captivity, and he chose the time to do it. He'll choose the time to bring them back. In Daniel chapter number 5 and verse number 18, O king, O thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. Who gave it to him? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob gave Nebuchadnezzar, a Babylonian pagan, gave him his kingdom. And so when you read this, you understand that even though they are, the circumstances don't look like uh, they're being blessed very much, they're still in the hands of Almighty God. In the book of Ezekiel, you find a vision, chapter number one of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel the prophet sees a throne moving and it has wheels underneath it. And it has cherubim moving in and out all around it. Five cherubim in the Bible, one's fallen and four are left. The one that fell is Satan. He's the anointed cherub that covereth. But in the book of Ezekiel, you have a throne that is mobile. It's mobile, see. It's only, it has wheels under it. A whirlwind about it. Fire flying in and out of it. And this vision Ezekiel sees while Israel is in captivity. So what's that mean? It means that the throne of God, of Almighty God, is wherever He puts it. And if he wants to put it on this earth, he puts it on this earth. If he wants to reign on this earth, he'll reign on this earth. And so in the book of Revelation, chapter number 11, the Bible says that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Not because men in their graciousness offer them up to God. That's not going to happen. Whoever has the biggest guns are the ones who make the laws in, this, in the world. Whoever has the biggest warships, the biggest armies, so forth and so on. As far as the Gentiles are concerned, from 606 B.C. until the second advent, it's one war right after another. And we're getting ready to go into another one. But in spite of all of the wars, he's still the sovereign God that determines the outcome. <laughs> he determines the outcome. We were outnumbered, outshot, outruled, outgunned, out everything when Great Britain, the biggest and greatest army in the world, lost to a bunch of farmers. <laughs> and yet they lost. You know why they lost? Because God was in it. He was in it. So 
this throne, this kingdoms, the empires of the world are subject to the sovereign will of God. That's the theme that you, that from, that, that's in Daniel and Ezekiel. It's important to understand that. That God didn't make, as the theists used to say, the theists, some of the founding fathers were theists. They believed God made it and then turned it loose and, and kind of watched to see what happened with it. No, sir. Don't believe that for a minute. What happens is that he created it and then he controls it and he guides it and he upholds all things by the word of his power. We watch his hand as it moves through the book of Daniel and as God begins to give prophecies to Daniel while they are in captivity. He shows Daniel the succession of one empire after another as they rise to prominence. He sees the Babylonian Empire. He sees the Medo-Persian Empire. He sees the Grecian Empire. He sees the Roman Empire. He sees the Roman Empire go into a mystical state where it is iron mixed with clay. He observes this. He watches an antichrist rise up out of that last empire. He sees that Antichrist as it exalts itself against the very God of heaven. He sees all these things while they are in Babylon. And he didn't get it from the Babylonians. He got it from the Lord God Almighty. Amen. That's what the book of Daniel is about. And I want you to look with me in Daniel chapter number 2. Daniel chapter number 2. And if you notice that he has an image, Nebuchadnezzar has an image revealed to him in a dream. Now God chose to reveal that image to a pagan. Now think about it for a minute. A pagan has a dream of an image, not a prophet, a pagan. You know, think on that for a while. <laughs> think about that for a while. Could he do that again? Certainly he could. Do anything he pleases. He's a sovereign God. But this is not a prophet. Nebuchadnezzar is not Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea. Jeremiah, I mean Nebuchadnezzar, is a pagan king. And he finds out, though, before this book is over with, who God is. Nebuchadnezzar finds out who the true and living God is. In chapter number 2 of the book of Daniel, and if you'll notice over here when you get on further into it, you'll see that he says in verse number 31, O king, thou sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. And the way we use the word terrible today is terrible. <laughs> the word terrible means full of terror. That's the way the Bible uses it. <laughs> See what I mean? You just learn things, and it becomes part of your culture. You know, somebody else said it. Well, that sounded good. I think I'll say that. <laughs> And that's what happens. But the word terrible means literally full of terror. In plainer words, when Nebuchadnezzar saw this image, it scared him to death. So the Bible says here, <coughs> the form <coughs> thereof was terrible. The head was of fine gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron, and part of clay. And then what he said is, You saw till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, he said, I'll tell you the interpretation. He continues to tell them how that Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold, the Medo-Persians would be the chest of silver, and the Grecians, which would follow in succession, would be the midsection of brass, Matthias brass, then the legs would be the terrible kingdom, this horrible kingdom, this kingdom that is unlike any other kingdom, which is Rome. And iron is associated with Rome. Now, don't you think about iron for a minute. Iron is something that can be dug directly from the ground. You can find iron, Okay. Steel is not dug from the ground. Where does steel come from? You have to mix, uh, depends on what kind of alloy you want, but uh, carbon, you mix it with iron, smelt it in a furnace, and you can produce steel. All right? So what you have here is an image that is metallic, and it is something that comes straight from the ground that God made and put in the earth, and up, up, up it comes. It is supporting the weight of all the rest of them. So what I believe, you have elements of Babylon, you have elements of Medo-Persia, you have elements of Greece, 
All of these are in that final Gentile kingdom before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the stone that the builders rejected that is cut out of a mountain and smites it not on its head, not on its chest, not on its midsection, but on its feet. And the feet of this image is iron mixed with clay, which is absolutely, as far as the natural world is concerned, impossible. It doesn't work. You can't mix iron with clay. It doesn't work. So there must be a supernatural element involved here. And that, of course, is what's going on. So now that's just skimming across the top of what's going on in Daniel chapter number 2 because I've got more visions I want to cover here this morning with you. But what he's doing is showing him how that in their outward splendor and glory, the Gentile kingdoms appear in such a, such a marvelous image that will strike terror into the hearts of men. And when you look at the armies of the world today and consider the strength projected by these armies, the U.S. just built a new destroyer. As a matter of fact, I was reading about it a couple of days ago, this destroyer. I forget the name of it, but this new destroyer that the U.S. has built, and, and I don't know if it's, if it's been commissioned yet or not, but this thing it makes every destroyer up until this point completely obsolete because of its firepower and because of its surveillance technology and all this other stuff that's with it. And they're going to send this thing out into the ocean, and it goes along with these huge uh, aircraft carriers. So the United States has a formidable navy, and a navy project, projects your power to the ends of the earth. That's what the navy's for. So the United States is a, a formidable power. It is a superpower. I mean, you have Trident submarines out there underneath the water. You don't see them, but they have enormous nuclear capabilities. They can wipe cities from the face of the earth. All this stuff is out there. Then standing armies, then air forces, and all the other stuff that goes with it. And not only the United States, but all the other armies of the world. So they're very imposing, very imposing in their appearance. But the Lord gives Daniel another vision of these same Gentile kingdoms, but instead of the outward appearance, it becomes a spiritual thing to understand what's going on inside these kingdoms. You see, the United States is a powerful entity to look at it from the outside. But if you've lived in this nation for a long time, you know all of its warts, cracks, and problems, don't you? Yes, sir, you certainly do. The United States is not an aircraft carrier. It's not a destroyer. It's not a B-52. So what is it? It's people. And the people that make up this nation are people that have problems. And this is what Daniel deals with when he gets into chapter number 7. For here's the next vision. Come over here with me to chapter number 7 of the book of Daniel. So what God does is give you a different perspective on the same thing. Daniel chapter number 7 and verse number 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream, told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion had eagle's wings. Then the, verse 5, the second was like a bear. Verse 6, then a leopard. Then in verse number 7, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, the Bible's very clear what you've read. That's not hard to read. The issue comes in, how do I interpret this? See, how do I interpret it? Now, there's a number of different interpretations as to who these beasts represent. In Daniel chapter number 2, there's no question about it. It spells it out. Nebuchadnezzar, thou art that head of gold. So there's no problem with that. And we know from history, Medo-Persian followed. We know the Greece followed. Then we know that Rome follows. Now, when we get to Daniel chapter number 7, it's not so easy because we have good men that don't agree with each other. When you look at Daniel chapter number 7 and look at the lion, the bear, the leopard, and then the dreadful beast, C.I. Schofield 
in his notes, and this is a Schofield Bible, as a matter of fact, right here. It's an old Schofield. In his notes, he says that the lion represents Babylon, the bear Medo-Persia, the leopard Greece, and then this dreadful kingdom is Rome. So what's he done? Well, he's taken these four beasts, he set them in parallel to the image of Daniel 2, and just took the head, made it the first beast, the chest, made it the second beast, midsection, third beast, and then the legs of iron and feet of, of clay, uh, and iron and clay, fourth beast. So he just parallels them together. All right. Now, Clarence Larkin, in his book of, of Daniel, how many's ever heard of Clarence Larkin? Most, most Baptists have. Fine man. Uh, his work on dispensational truth is a fine piece of work. I've got, I've got four or five. I don't know how many books he's got. I've got the Spirit World, the Book of Daniel, the Dispensational Truth. I may have some others. Brother Larkin, uh, in his own notes, he says this. He says, The first beast that Daniel saw emerge from the seething foam of the great sea was like a lion. And he says, uh, This beast was Babylon, the Babylonian Empire, and its first king, Nebuchadnezzar. So what he does is parallel them, one with the other, and gives you an, uh, an interpretation like that. But all Christians don't agree. How many's ever heard of Peter Ruckman? All right. Brother Ruckman teaches that the beast line up like this, that the lion is Medo-Persia, that the bear is Greece, and that the leopard is Rome. And he takes that from chapter 7, verse 17. Look over there with me, please. I'm not going to get real technical with you. I know we can get into a lot of stuff here. And I just want to show you, though, how that good men can differ in their interpretation of the facts. The Bible is factually true. It's the interpretation of it. Now look at chapter number 7 of Daniel, verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which what? shall arise out of the earth. So Peter Ruckman takes that to mean that they represent kingdoms that follow Nebuchadnezzar, that in the future kingdoms. So who am I going to do? I'm not going to try to disprove any of them. I'm going to give it out to you this morning and let you understand that in your study of the Bible, you just need to know that as you read Scripture, that you're not a heretic if you don't agree who the leopard is. <laughs> you see. You, you, you may disagree with someone else on what that is and the interpretation of it because the interpretation of these things are important because here's why. Daniel chapter number 7 gives you these beasts, all right, the lion, the bear, the leopard, then this nondescript terrible beast projected into the future because they are types or they represent something that's taking place in the end time, which is today. So that means that the lion has its modern counterpart, the bear has its modern counterpart, the leopard has its modern counterpart, and this terrible beast has its modern counterpart. Now I'm going to be honest with you this morning, as honest as I know how. When I try to teach a class, I try to, I try to give you sometimes, if there are differing views and different sides, to give you both sides. Sometimes there's three sides, <laughs> four, whatever. And let me give you an indication of it. I want to give you just for a moment, something that I hope will make you think. This is from Sir Robert Anderson, the coming prince. All right? Now, this man right here is a very smart man. If you want to get into the nuts and bolts of Daniel's 70 weeks, of all of the years and the dates and all that stuff involved with it, this is the book to get. Listen to what he says about the birth of Christ. This is the birth of Christ. The birth of our Lord is placed in B.C. 1 by Pearson and Hug, B.C. 2 by Scaliger, B.C. 3 by, by Baronius, Calvisus, Suskin, and Paulus, B.C. 4 by Lamy, Bengal, Anger, Weisler, and Greswell, B.C. 5 by Usher, Patavius, Idler, and someone else here, and then B.C. 7 by Zunft. So which one are you going to choose? <laughs> Nobody around here was around in 5 B.C. Now, they go into detail about how they arrive at those dates. Each one of these men spent an enormous amount of time 
to determine in their own belief which date is accurate for the birth of Christ. So you'll hear me say time and time again, somewhere around 5 B.C. is the birth of Christ. Can I prove it's 5 B.C.? No. Can I prove it's 4? No. Can I prove he was born? Yes, sir. <laughs> Amen. A year. You know, we have leap years. We have leap years because our calendar, uh, saying 365 days, is just not quite accurate enough, so we have to have a leap year to take care of the fact that there's a discrepancy in our calendar. But a prophetic year in the Bible is not 365 days or 366 days. It's 360 days. That's a prophetic year. So what's that mean? When you get into Daniel chapter number 9 and verse number 27, of the 70th week or 70 weeks of Daniel, you have 490 years of prophecy to be fulfilled. In other words, you have 490 360s. Okay? That's another way to say it. You've got 490 360s. 360 day years. Here's another thing. God counts fulfillment of prophecy and prophetic years when he's doing something to bring it to pass. And he may start it here and stop it here and pick it up and start it again over here. That's important. It took me a while to learn that. That you don't start chronologically at this point and measure off, say, 500 years to this point and say, well, it wasn't fulfilled here. It wasn't fulfilled there because God didn't count it like that. He counts it the way he counts it, and we've got to learn how he does that. For example, he said 69 years separated that out of the 70, or 69 weeks of years out of the 70. That's been fulfilled. There's no question about it. Messiah was cut off. The Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross at Calvary, and he died for us. That fulfilled 69 of those 70 weeks. There's one week left that hasn't been fulfilled. It's been 2,000 years, and God's in no hurry to fulfill that 70th week. But of course, with him, a 1,000 years is as a day, and a day is a 1,000 years. We're just a puff of smoke passing through portals of time. We're here today and gone tomorrow. But when that 70th week starts, it will be fulfilled. And here's the key to knowing when that 70th week starts. It will be the signing of a covenant of peace between the Antichrist and Israel. This is why everybody, Bible uh, students, get so, uh, I guess the word excited, or what word you'd want to use, when they see a war as it, as it applies to Israel. Just like what we talked about at the beginning of the lesson today. If Israel strikes Iran within the next 30 days, they may very well pull in a lot of other powers. Why? Because powerful, because nations are watching very carefully any vacuum that develops. They watch the rise, they watch for the rise of the rulers and dictators of whatever country. They want to know if they're friendly or they want to know if they're belligerent. They want to know if, the, if, they're, if they're going to be able to work with them or not. So they are very interested in any war that's going on and the shifting of power. And so they're going to be watching very carefully if Israel strikes Iran. You have other nations that have signed agreements and treaties. That's what happened in World War I. When they, when they, when they assassinated the Archduke over there in, in uh, Sarajevo, it didn't look like anything at all, no big deal. And then all of a sudden, these other nations that had agreements with each other got sucked into it. And that's how World War I got started. It wasn't because, like Hitler in World War II, when he was just simply, he sent his armies out into Poland and the rest of it. That's how it happened. So this is how wars get started. So if this thing happens, it could be like a domino effect. And if it's like a domino effect, when Israel strikes Iran, it could easily explode into a world war. Then the stage is set for the man of sin to sign a peace agreement with Israel. And that is what kicks off Daniel's 70th week. Yeah. And that will go for a period of seven years. And it's divided again 
into three and a half and three and a half. It's divided into the first three and a half and to the last three and a half. In plainer words, right smack down the middle. In cut and two, the first half is called the tribulation. The last half is called the great tribulation. The Lord said in Matthew 24, except those days be short and no flesh shall be left alive. So it's going to be a time that this earth has never known before. This is why when a Bible student looks at that, he says to himself, well, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 says that that day shall not come except their falling away come. In 2 Thessalonians 2, it's talking about the man of sin that will be revealed, the son of perdition. That means that right now, while I'm alive in this world, that I may very well and probably have seen the Antichrist. I've seen him. He hasn't been revealed as the Antichrist, but I've seen him. Now, I could sit down right now and name off at least two or three that are fully qualified, fully qualified, and running for the office. <laughs> yes, sir, of Antichrist. Keep in mind, the Antichrist is a human being just like you but he will have supernatural power invested in him. According to Revelation 13, he has a deadly wound to his head. And on the third day, he will rise from the dead. That's supernatural, along with the power of God. That's part of the great deception, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. I will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And in Revelation 13, it says, Then who can make war with the beast who had the deadly wound and was healed? So at the moment he comes up with the deadly wound healed, he's no longer a human being like you and me. He is Satan incarnate. Satan literally incarnates himself into that man. He has a, he has a, he has a proxy, he has a patsy, the, the, the false prophet. The false prophet will be trumpeting the glory of the Antichrist. He'll be preaching to the world about how great the Antichrist is. Now, if you're a Roman Catholic, I'm not saying anything to try to offend you, but I'm going to have to tell you the truth. They have a Jesuit pope right now, the only pope that has ever been a Jesuit. The Jesuits came from Ignatius Loyola back in the 1500s. They're different. I'm, I get on this Catholic website, and this girl on there, she's a financial advisor. I read her about every week. I want to see what she's got to say because she's a dedic dedicated Catholic. There's nothing like going inside and listening to what the people have to say who are in it. She hates this Pope. She despises him because he has said, atheists can go to heaven. If you want to be a sodomite, who is he to judge you? He's already deposed a German uh, Archbishop who had a multi-million dollar villa over there in Germany, he said, uh, come over and pay me a visit. So that, uh, so that uh, cardinal or archbishop came to Rome and paid the Pope a visit, and when he left, he had been put down. The Pope took him out of his authority, removed him. This Pope is making waves in the Catholic Church. He's saying... Uh, by his actions, not necessarily words. He's saying by his actions that he intends to change the Roman Catholic Church. And nobody, unless they assassinate him, has the power to stand up and stop him because their, their very faith is that he's the vicar of Christ. When he speaks ex cathedra from the seat, he speaks with, with uh, absolute uh, uh, authority. And he according to some researchers who've done a lot of work in this, is already leading the Catholic Church in the idea that they will be the ones who will reform the world through his ministry. And how, what do you, how do you mean that? I mean it this way, that this Petrus Romanus, this final pope that was a Roman, Peter the Roman, when this man first went into office, somebody said, well, his name's not Peter. Yes, but he, his parents are from Italy. He was born in Argentina. Have we done run over the time? It's about three or four minutes yet. His parents are from Italy. 
He was, he was born, raised in Argentina. He took the name of St. Francis of Assisi. And Francis' name, before he was, he, he took the name Francis, his name was Peter. So this man has chosen to identify himself with Peter, a Roman. And this Malachi gave out this prophecy. When was it? 10, 50, 11, 11, 15, somewhere back in there. I gave it to you before a couple of months ago. He gave out this prophecy back then about how that this would be the final pope. Now, if this is the final pope, and Israel is about to go into a war, we are on the verge of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. On the very verge of it. The very door. He's at the door. And as I told you at the opening of this, of this study to, this morning, the Affordable Care Act, they, they surveyed some people the other day and they said, uh, which one do you like the best, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare? And they said, well, I don't know. I like Obamacare better, I think. That's who put him in office. That's sad. But we are, as I said to you a moment ago, there is in that legislation of the Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, the possibility that you can be injected with a, with a microchip. And that opens the door to fulfill that you can't buy or sell, can't do anything without the mark of the beast. And so I say to you this morning, with all honesty and love as I know how, if you're not born again and you miss the catching away of the church of God, don't take the mark. If you have to die, die. But don't take the mark. Because if you take the mark, you'll seal your doom. And there is no hope for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use what I've said this morning for the glory of God. In thy name we pray. Amen.